good to do that. Do some explosive uh, style stuff after a generalized warm up at the beginning of the workout, right? Why? Because it's gonna excite your central nervous system, right? You're gonna feel like, you know, you got a little bit of caffeine, right? You're kind of jacked up, right? If you ever notice that, just try doing some like explosive jumps real quick and notice how it changes your physiology. How do you feel psychologically after you do that? Do you feel more alert or less alert? Chances are you're gonna feel more alert from doing that, right? Hey guys, Aaron Kubitz, personal trainer, functional aesthetic CC, helping average guys perform better inside and outside the gym. In today's video, we're gonna be covering strength training mistake number four, or actually muscle building mistake number four, and that is Frankenstein your workouts or blending different workouts for different goals together into one workout. Okay, and so, what you often see today, and this is typically for workouts designed for the general population because people have short attention spans, is that you will have workouts where you're doing some strength training and then you're doing some cardio, or you are doing the strength training but you're taking very short rest periods in between sets, right? And the draw to this can oftentimes be that you get a psychological boost, right? Because you feel that you're getting in a great workout because you feel exhausted at the end, you're drenched in sweat, and your heart rate is going through the roof, right? And so because of that, a lot of people will think, well, I'm getting a great workout in, right? When in reality, they're potentially expending a lot of effort for subpar gains in both the cardiovascular realm and the strength realm. Now you'd think that in 2023, this misnomer that the reason that you exercise is to burn calories would be dead and buried, and yet many people are still checking their Fitbits to see how many calories they burn in the workout. And again, if that helps you to stay motivated to work out because it's a, an actual metric that you can measure like, hey, I burn this amount of calories, I think I'm making progress. But the problem is, those are potentially not the metrics that you want to be measuring as a measure of your success, right? In, 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 and your progress and if whether or not you're increasing your fitness, right? Because there is a principle of progressive overload, right? And we've talked about this in some other videos, is that in order to progress, you need to be 
over time, making your workouts more difficult in some manner. And what people usually do is that they will just do more reps of something or they'll run more miles or whatever because those are the things that on their Fitbit or something will show, hey, I burned more calories, right? And it makes them feel, hey, I did this plank for 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever the case may be. And my thought is if you're doing a plank, why don't you just do push-ups because that way you'll be using your triceps, your shoulders, and you'll be training your core and to a higher degree than just holding a static plank for that amount of time. So rather than going longer, increase that intensity, right? And so those are some metrics that you want to be looking at. You want to be looking at, hey, am I progressively doing, being able to do more reps with the same amount of weight? Am I able to lift more, more weight? Am I able to take shorter rest periods in between sets and still complete the same amount of volume? Those are all measures that your fitness is improving, right? So now going back to the topic at hand of blending these things together, blending different types of workouts together, right? Where you have strength training combined with the cardio uh, and you're kind of blending the protocols for both of those. And so now you have this just homogenous soup of a workout that burns a bunch of calories, but we don't really know exactly what sort of performance metric we're pursuing, right? And I realized that there are some training programs, right? Like for mixed martial arts, you will have them where you're doing stuff where it's more metabolic. You know, if you're doing kettlebell, kettlebell circuits, things like that. Um, and, but even that, you know, I, I was recently reading a book by Joel Jameson, right? He uh, trains a lot of mixed martial arts fighters and stuff at a very high level. Um, and he was, it, it is very, actually very fascinating the different ways you could train the body and it's a very specific calculated way, right? You're not just mishmashing everything together with no rhyme or reason behind it, right? So traditionally, for strength training, rest periods are two to five minutes in between sets. And this is a lot of times why powerlifting routines will take a lot longer than a bodybuilding routine because you are taking longer to recover in between those sets. And this becomes more pronounced the stronger you get, believe it or not, right? Uh, the heavier the weight you're moving, the more energy you're going to be expending, right? So, for example, a guy who's a kind of a beginner, right? Maybe he's squatting 135 and he's doing like 10, 12 reps with that, right? Then you get some guy and he's doing, you know, five reps with, you know, three, 400 pounds or whatever, maybe even more. And he's going to have to take longer to recover, even though he's at a more advanced level, simply just because it's more energy expended. As I've talked about in some other, in some other videos, that the energy uh, expended, in a set, it scales directly with the intensity of the exercise, i.e. the amount of load that you're moving in that set, right? So that's why somebody can recover a little bit faster, right? So that's why even if you're only doing five reps, taking that longer rest period makes sense to recharge and regenerate your ATP stores so that you can go and do it again, right? And that's the point. When you're training for maximal strength, you want to make sure that you're as fresh as possible going into the next set because you're trying to train for intensity. Same thing goes for like box jumps or something, right? A lot of times people use the box jumps, and this is usually in these group fitness classes for the general population, they use a box jump as a metabolic tool, right? as a cardio tool, right? When in actuality, when you're doing like explosive work, it's supposed to be, maybe you're doing like anywhere between one to six reps. And it's supposed to be as, in, as fast as you can, as explosive as you can. And as soon as that intensity level declines at all, that's when your set ends, right? Now contrast that with bodybuilding, right? So bodybuilding, you still want to have a good measure of intensity, but anywhere between like, you know, 30 to 60 seconds of rest in between sets is a good protocol for bodybuilding, right? Because in addition to time under tension, having that metabolic stress of lower rest periods can induce the release of uh, anabolic hormones like testosterone, human growth hormone, right? And which can be beneficial there. And Honestly, with bodybuilding and building more muscle, it's a little bit more nuanced, right? We, as I've talked about in some other videos, you have these ranges that are generally recognized as hypertrophy ranges, strength ranges, and endurance ranges. But really, when it comes to bodybuilding, you want to use all the ranges, but for the sake of efficiency, 
uh, in practicality, you want to stay right in that moderate range the majority of the time with excursions into the extremely high rep ranges and very and lower rep ranges from time to time to work both ends, right? Because the lower rep range is going to help with that mechanical tension or causing the micro tears in the muscle fibers uh, and causing that uh, myofibril uh, um, hypertrophy versus the... Um, uh, was it sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, right? Um, and in and, and the myofibril hypertrophy is where the muscle fiber itself actually grows larger, right? Whereas the sarcoplasmic one, which is usually with high rep traditional bodybuilding science training, the fluid around the muscles and stuff in the sarcoplasm actually expands, and so the muscle grows and looks bigger because of that. Uh, because of that expansion, right? So the muscle fiber didn't actually grow larger. So you want a mix of both of these so to really optimize your muscle growth, right? Now, going on to the endurance thing, right? So endurance um, is usually your rest periods are going to be, you know, 30 seconds, maybe even less, right? Um, in between your sets of exertion, right? And the sets might go on as long as, you know, 90 seconds. Now, one, now this is the standard protocol, but in my mind, oftentimes I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in this thing, which is maybe not making my point in this video the best. But if you're doing a set that takes you 90 seconds to complete, you would think that maybe you would want to rest longer because it took you... A, you like you expended more ener like energy, right? You were working for a longer period of time. Maybe you'd want to rest longer before the next one. But again, going back to that thing, intensity scales the amount of energy expended, right? So again, for endurance, it's usually about 30 seconds or less of rest in between in, in between your sets, and you're going usually about 90 seconds or more um, for the duration of the set constitutes an endurance thing, right? So if you get into a group exercise class and they're having you do some, uh, uh, some you know, biceps curls or some bent over rows or something, and then they're having you go right after that and do some burpees or, you know, some box jumps or something or jump on an exercise bike and start going right away, you're not really, you might be increasing your stamina, you might be increasing your kind of aerobic fitness overall, right? Um, over time, but you're not really, you know, optimizing for either muscular growth or strength, right? Because you're not allowing enough recovery time for complete uh, restoration of ATP, and uh, so that when you go into that next set, you're not going to have the amount of, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to apply the same amount of intensity because you're already still fatigued from what you just did because you didn't allow enough time to recover. Now. A anecdotal application of this or experience of mine was, I don't know, probably back in 2013, 2014, and I was working out at Gold's Gym, and I had my little circuit that I'd do, and, you know, I'd come in after work and just try to get in there and get it done in 45 minutes to an hour, and so everything was just back-to-back, -back, you know, uh, superset and everything, right? And... It was a pretty efficient way to go. I could get through all my stuff in a very short period of time. Now, the owner of the gym stopped to talk with me uh, for a bit, and so my rest period on my lat pulldowns for that day ended up being, instead of, you know, uh, the, you know, I don't know, like however, it's probably usually enough about enough time to swap out, you know, plates or to walk from one exercise station to the next was about the amount of rest that I gave myself before going to the next exercise, right? And so I was actually able to add 20 pounds onto my lat pull down thing and do about the same amount of reps just because I was able to rest for, you know, three minutes or so while I was talking to uh, the owner of the gym, right? And so I was able to actually lift more weight, apply more anabolic stimulus. Uh, more stimulus for growth and strength by being able to actually lift more weight.
Now when it comes down to the research in uh, surrounding rest periods in regards to building muscle and strength, there's a couple things to consider, right? So what they've shown is that on the one hand, if you allow longer time uh, rest period in between sets, it will, on the one hand, allow you theoretically to have more energy to be able to perform more reps per set, right? And then on the other hand, it'll be able to allow you to uh, perform more reps in subsequent sets because you'll be more rested uh, from the previous set, right? And so total training volume, which again is a key driver of muscular growth, will increase by allowing longer rest periods in between, right? And you also want to, you know, play around with balancing, you know, a little bit longer rest period with a little bit shorter rest period to tap into both the, you know, uh, the metabolic aspect of, uh, of muscular growth and also the, uh, um, the intensity or the, uh, the rest long enough to be able to maintain a higher, a consistent intensity over, over your sets, right? Now that's, in terms of muscular growth, right? When it comes to muscular strength though, they showed that, you know, shorter rest periods didn't really have a negative effect on intensity, right? On, on, on muscular intent, uh, on workout intensity, provided that, uh, or, or on muscular strength, my bad, provided that intensity was maintained between sets. And that's a big if, right? Because it can take anywhere between two to five minutes after, you know, a hard set of one to six reps for ATP to completely regenerate, right? And as I've talked about in some other videos, just because your primary goal is strength training doesn't mean that you want to completely do away with cardio because cardio actually having a good cardiovascular system will actually help you to regenerate ATP faster and that's why walking around in between sets is better than just sitting still, right? It's going to help you to actually recover your ATP stores faster, recover your cardiovascular system faster and in general, right? So from that aspect, but there is the very real thing that you don't want to be going into, you don't want to, you know, do a heavy set of five or three, and then 30 seconds to a minute later, try to go and do the same thing again, because you're very likely not going to be able to do the same amount of reps that you with the same amount of weight that you did on the previous set, thereby decreasing total work volume and total intensity of, of your workout, right? Now, if you can maintain your intensity though, which is not very likely, with shorter rest periods, then by all means do it because again, the research and not surprisingly so, shows that as long as you can maintain intensity, it doesn't really matter how long you're doing the rest periods, which for me, seems like it doesn't even need to be said. Because, well obviously, if you can maintain your intensity, who cares about the rest period? The whole point of the rest period is so that you can maintain the same level of intensity and the same amount of reps in the subsequent set so that you can have a higher total work volume in the workout. So in summary, you need to be very clear about the goals that you are pursuing with your workout, right? Because at the end of the day, the goal of the workout is not to expend more calories. Yes, exercise can be a way to help you enter a calorie deficit, but that should not 
be your first and primary goal of your workout. Your goal for your workout should be building and or maintaining lean muscle and improving your performance for whatever your chosen sport or activity is. So if you're trying to build more muscle, rest periods for multi-joint movements, so things like bent over rows, maybe doing pull-ups and stuff, doing a rest period of, you know, two minutes or so can be beneficial for that, right? If you're doing isolation exercises like biceps curls, tricep extensions, rope press downs, dumbbell kickbacks, anywhere between 60 to 90 seconds is ideal for allowing you to work in that moderate intensity rep range for hypertrophy. So a very common goal for non-athletes and athletes alike, but more, more prevalent among people who are uh, just want to get in shape is to lose body fat, right? Um, they say that, you know, I don't know, at least 50% of the adult population in the United States is overweight, right? And so it's a very common gym goal is I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to build a little bit of muscle, and I want to lose some body fat, right? Now, even if your goal is primarily, first and foremost, to be losing body fat, that can't be the only thing that you're focusing on in your workout. Again, that kind of comes back to that thing of focusing on how many calories you're burning because we know that we need to be in a calorie deficit if we want to lose weight, which is not entirely true. I mean, it is true, but there's other factors at play as well, right? Because if you simply diet, right, and you don't do any exercise, it's going to send a signal to your body that, hey, we're in the starvation state. In fact, starvation is so bad that we don't even have the energy to go out and do things. And we're just sitting here, you know, waiting to die or waiting for the food to come, right? And so it sends a signal to the body, right? And so the body's going to be like, oh, we're not using these muscles. These muscles are using energy at rest they're increasing metabolic rate, and they're not our heart, they're not our digestive system, and they're not our brain, they're not our eyeballs, they're not necessary to keeping you alive. So let's pull a little bit from that tissue that is, at the moment, not the critical, most critical tissue that we're using because we're not using it for any vigorous activities. So you will start to lose body fat, and you'll start to lose muscle at the same rate, and this is what happens when you get somebody who is skinny fat because they end up losing both muscle and fat at the same rate and they end up just a smaller version of what they were before. Instead of getting lean, athletic look that you're looking for, they're still soft looking, but they're smaller. And this is not what we want. So, with that being said, that is why it is critical when you're working out that you choose a form of activity or a combination of forms of activity and you have the goal of your workout to be burning, choosing exercises that are not only burning calories and helping you to get into that calorie deficit, but also that are burning in calories in such a way that they're sending a signal to your body that, hey, we need to hang on to this muscle or we need to even increase the size of this muscle and have it get bigger, right? Because that's one reason why a person who, let's say if you have 20% or more body fat, right, and you're trying to lose, lose, uh, lose that, you can build muscle and gain strength even as you're losing the body fat, provided your diet, you're eating the appropriate diet. And the reason for this is, is because it actually 
you know, there, there's like, what do they say? Like about 3,500 calories in a pound of fat, somewhere around there. It requires a lot more energy to build a pound of muscle than it does to burn a pound of fat. So while you're building that pound of muscle through resistance training and you're in this calorie deficit, provided you've, you're eating the right diet that is has you adapting to burning fat and not sugar, because if you just simply cut your calories without focusing on where the calories that you do eat are coming from, you can run into trouble as well. But what will happen is, oh, my body doesn't have enough you know, calories from dietary fat come in, let's use some of this body fat to help create the muscle that our body is trying to build, right? Because your body doesn't want to be at 20% body fat, 30% body fat, 40% body fat. The reason it is, is because of poor lifestyle choices, which aren't necessarily completely your fault. I mean, we're surrounded by a lot of unnatural things in society today, right? We are, you go to the grocery store and the majority of the food there is unnatural, highly processed, hyper palatable food, which is designed to get you to buy more of it, eat more of it, right? So that the manufacturer can make more money, not to make you the healthiest, strongest version of yourself, right? And these foods send the signal to your body to continue eating more food and to also burn more sugar for fuel versus being able to switch back and forth between burning sugar and burning fat efficiently. And so when you start eating a diet that is in more in harmony with your biology, more in harmony with the way that humans are supposed to be eating, you'll have this ability to transfer back and forth between burning fat, burning sugar, right? And so if there's not enough sugar available, your body will start burning fat. If there's not enough fat in the diet coming in, your body will start burning the, body, the fat off the body, right? And since your body doesn't want to be at that higher believe it or not, doesn't want to be at that higher body fat percentage, when you provide the right environment, it will run towards that, and so it will allow you to build muscle even as you are losing body fat. Okay, so in wrapping up this video, there isn't a time and a place when combining different strength training protocols, different fitness protocols, different workout designs can help you and be beneficial, right? However, it's not for the purposes of maximizing hypertrophy, not for the purposes of maximizing strength, not for the purposes of optimizing your aerobic fitness, right? However, what it will do is if you are a strong athletic guy or if you are a guy who has a lot of muscle already and you got some strength and you want to lean out and maintain that strength and maintain that muscle, there are ways that you can work out and do that, right? And this is what I call my hybrid strength training methodology where it combines your strength training, which is more or less a powerlifting style of training, with a bodybuilding style of training with a speed or explosive style of training, which would be for like, you know, basketball players, track athletes, you know, Olympic lifting, things of that nature, right? It could be beneficial for people who are involved in mixed martial arts as well. Explosive speed and power, punching, kicking, things like that. And then also your muscular endurance slash aerobic endurance and then wrapping it all up, tying it all together with nervous system reset. What I mean by nervous system reset? Nervous system reset is when you're doing power or explosive style training, right? It's good to do that. Do some explosive uh, style stuff after a generalized warm up at the beginning of the workout, right? Why? Because it's gonna excite your central nervous system, right? You're gonna feel like, you know, I got a little bit of caffeine, right? You're kind of jacked up, right? If you ever notice that, just try doing some like explosive jumps real quick and notice how it changes your physiology. How do you feel psychologically after you do that? Do you feel more alert or less alert? Chances are you're gonna feel more alert from doing that, right? So you do that at the beginning. However, you don't wanna stay in this jacked up high adrenaline state all the time, right? 
that's actually a problem in society, right? When we're always extending ourselves, always working and stuff, we're always competitive, which there's not nothing wrong with competition, there's nothing wrong with trying to be the best version of yourself to achieve self-actualization, right? However, if you're taking caffeine, taking stimulus, doing all this stuff to go out there and drive, 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 and you keep that adrenaline ramped up all the time, what happens eventually? Adrenal glands burn out, you end up not having energy, you end up accumulating a bunch of excess body fat and achieving the exact opposite thing of what you're trying to achieve in the first place. So, you can have your regular workouts and then having things like deep breathing, meditation, progressive muscle relaxation, doing things like this at the ends of your high intensity workouts to bring the nervous system back down to a more grounded and regulated state. And these are all things that I talk about in my hybrid strength workout. I also combine this with targeted nutrition designed to be synergistic with the workouts that you're doing. Not just generally healthy diet, eating whole foods and balanced macros, but specific macro ratios for the particular phase of the workout with the exercise program that you're in to optimize not only your force production and your performance, but also allowing you to, in conjunction with the design of that workout, burn off excess body fat as well. So if you're interested in finding out more about that program, you can send me an email at the email that's in the description box below or in the about section of this, uh, of this channel it is aceproaaron at gmail.com. You can send your questions there and I will send you a couple guides uh, to get you started, get your thinking started on how to train the strength, hybrid strength methodology. And uh, next month or so, I'm gonna actually have the program built out for online training so that if you want to get the full version of this, you can try that out. There's gonna be three different programs for that. You've got Hybrid Strength 101, which is for beginners or athletes who have been out of the game for a while, looking to build up their general fitness, general physical preparedness program, right? Regain their mobility, regain their cardiovascular and muscular endurance capacities, improve metabolic health, that kind of stuff. Hybrid Strength 2.0 is the next step up from that, right? Where we take it to the next level. We build upon the principles that we are treat, te uh, teaching in Hybrid Strength 101. And then advanced hybrid strength is for guys who are currently doing powerlifting, bodybuilders, um, you know, people who met, might even like CrossFit type workouts, might probably enjoy this kind of workout. And the advantage of going through this whole process is that you can, it's really good for when you hit a very busy season of your, in your life, when you don't have a couple hours to spend in the gym, right? and focus on these bodybuilding goals or you don't have the time to if you're a runner go out there and do these you know hour-long runs and all that kind of stuff and you can very efficiently maintain your strength and your muscle mass and stay lean at the same time in a very short period of time with advanced hyper strength training so guys if you enjoyed this video make sure hit make sure to hit the like button and we will see you, and if you'd like to see more content like this, because uh, I've got to wrap up the video like this, if you'd like to see more content like this uh, related to workout design for building muscle, increasing strength, improving your athletic performance, or helping you to burn body fat more efficiently, as well as nutrition advice, general holistic health, because that's kind of the thing of this channel. I'm not just about bodybuilding, powerlifting, you know, long distance running, athletic performance, any of these kind of things. I'm about total full spectrum health, right? Combination of all these different things. And in order to achieve long-term health so that you're not just super strong in your 20s and in your 30s, but you're able to maintain a high level of health, functionality and fitness into your 70s and 80s, then you have to look at the broad picture of not only fitness aspect of things, nutrition aspect of things, stress management, time management, um, your gut health, all these different aspects of, and, and again, injury prevention, right? 
how to avoid the injuries by training in appropriate ways, how to work around the injuries if you do sustain them. So if any of those things interest you, then consider subscribing to the channel by hitting the button in the lower right hand corner of the screen. And we'll see you all next weekend for more health and fitness information.